Good morning, everyone. Um, I want to give um, just a minute or two while we let people log on. Um, but we will be starting this webinar in just a minute or two. All right. Well, that um, looks like people have um, logged on, and I want to welcome everybody to the Florida Friendly Landscaping Professional Webinar Series. Um, we're really excited to start 2024 off, um, and today's webinar is Our Precious Palms Lethal Bronzing Disease Update, um, and I know I'm really looking forward to this webinar um, you may have noticed your web your microphones have been muted. Um, so please put your questions in the chat box or the Q&A box, and we will take those at the end of this webinar. Um, th it, this webinar has been approved for one CEU, for FFLCP, for LIAF, for FDEX, um, and also for FNGLA. There is a 50 $15 administration fee to receive this CEU, and I'll put a link in the chat box um, to make payment if you have not already done so. Um, we'll submit the CEUs on Friday um, to give people a chance to register for those CEUs after the webinar is over. Um, and this is part of a monthly webinar series held on the second Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. Our next webinar will be February 13th using water wisely and irrigation design standards overview with Emily Lang and Deirdre Irwin. Um, and also one other thing to um, remind you of is that you will see a survey invitation pop up. Please take a moment to fill this out at the end of the survey. It really helps us determine what we're um, going to offer in the future as far as educational programming and also ways that we can improve these webinars to suit you. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn this over to Tom Wickman to introduce today's speaker. Thanks, Claire. I am Tom Wickman. I'm the associate, uh, the assistant director for the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program and the statewide coordinator for the Green Industries Best Management Practices Program. So it's uh, it's great to have so many folks here. We're approaching. It looks like we're uh, somewhere around 100 folks already that uh, have logged in. So early in the year, it's really important because uh, this is a topic that uh, should interest so many folks. So let me introduce our speaker. Dr. Brian Bader is an associate, uh, associate professor at the University of Florida Fort Lauderdale Research and Education Center. He specializes in insect vector ecology, specifically in vector discovery of new and emerging pathogens that cause economic loss in agricultural and ornamental cropping systems as well as understanding the evolutionary relationships and molecular mechanisms that determine the ability of species to transmit pathogens. His current research interests include the epidemiology of phytoplasmas, infecting palms, as well as other common tropical ornamental plants and their associated diseases and insect pests, and developing management strategies to reduce economic loss. Dr. Bader has degrees in entomology from the University of Delaware, University of Florida, and his PhD from Washington State University. Today, he'll be presenting an update on the horrible palm disease, lethal bronzing. Let me turn the floor over to Dr. Brian Bader. Take it away. Thanks, Tom. Hello, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you uh, for tuning in uh, to hear on the update on lethal bronzing, where we are with the, uh, the research. Um, before I get too far into it, just a quick uh, thank you to my funding sources, both nationally and internationally, that have kind of helped build this program, uh, to my students and staff over the years. Uh, one update that I need to get out is uh, they fund my PhD student, who was the primary driver on the vector research, um, is no longer in my lab. She is now an assistant professor at the Everglades Research and Education Center, and she's doing vector research in um, more of the traditional agricultural crops. So uh, just so everybody knows that she's off doing, uh, still doing vector work, just not lethal, lethal bronzing, but we're keeping at it. Um, 
So uh, just to give a brief history, I know at this point, lethal bronzing is probably well known uh, to most of you. So I'm not going to go into too much detail, but in case anybody's new or haven't haven't heard, I wanted to give a uh, a brief crash course on the, the history. Um, lethal bronzing is uh, part of a group collectively called the palm lethal declined uh, phytoplasmas. And uh, globally, there's different strains and different groups that cause death in, in different palm species. And uh, they're only kind of loosely related. Uh, the group of interest for us is the uh, group that's in the Caribbean basin. Now, in this region, there are three distinct uh, clades, or excuse me, three distinct species of phytoplasma that kill palms uh, where we are. Uh, you have uh, historically lethal yellowing, which many of you might be aware of, caused a lot of death in coconut palms in South Florida in the 70s and 80s and into the 90s. Uh, it's still around, kind of lingering, but it's not nearly as prevalent as lethal bronzing which is the second species and currently the one that's causing the most damage uh, throughout the state. And uh, the third one um, you can see in this tree here, uh, it's the subgroup E. And this is an obscure strain that also kills coconut and it's known from Dominican Republic and Mexico. Uh, and I'm really not gonna talk about this one too much. Um, I'll bring it up later when I talk about diagnostics, but uh, for the most part, we're going to stick to lethal bronzing with a few little uh, plugs on lethal yellowing throughout the, the talk. Um, now, lethal yellowing was first found in Jamaica in the late 1800s, and it showed up in Florida in the late um, 1930s uh, in Key West, and then started spreading throughout the state. Um, lethal bronzing actually showed up uh, in 2006, so around the same time that uh, HLB showed up. And you can see here on the left, uh, this is characteristic symptoms of lethal yellowing uh, in a coconut palm where the fronds get this bright yellow. Uh, you can see the historical, the point of introduction is that little red explosion mark and the general um, pattern of spread. And uh, lethal bronzing, as I said, was 2006, but it was first documented around the Tampa area and has subsequently spread throughout pretty much the entire state. Now, we don't have records from every county officially, but at this point, I, I would be willing to bet you could probably find it if you looked hard enough in every, every county. Uh, and one of the reasons why LB has spread much further and uh, had what I consider a much more severe impact to Florida is the host range. Um, you know, LY pretty much only attacked coconut, whereas lethal bronzing, uh, the primary hosts are cabbage palm and phoenix palm, both of which can be grown uh, pretty much throughout the entire state of Florida. So there's a lot more susceptible hosts over a much larger uh, area than, than LY. Um, so this is the current, uh, host range of the phytoplasmas, um, with lethal bronzing, we're currently up to 21 confirmed palm species that are susceptible. Uh, you can see in this column here, um, the, uh, for subgroups, it has the classifications as A, B, or D, uh, or E, and just for your reference, the A phytoplasma is lethal yellowing. Uh, B and D are the same thing, and that's lethal bronzing. And E is the one that we I mentioned uh, uh, a few slides ago as being from uh, Dominican Republic and Mexico. But B and D are our lethal bronzing phytoplasma, and it's known from 21 different species. And the recent species we documented as hosts are uh, needle palm, Raphidophyllum hystrix, and the dwarf sugar palm, Oranga angleri. And, you know, as this disease continues to spread and, and go into new areas, uh, especially in the South, where there's a higher palm diversity and density, 
Uh, I expect over time, uh, we're going to eventually start seeing more and more new hosts uh, of this, this phytoplasm. But this is where we currently stand on the host range um, for lethal bronzing. Uh, this chart should be on my, my website. Uh, I've put the link at the end of the presentation so you can go there and check. And uh, I've if it's not there for some reason or the link's broken, uh, just email me and uh, I can, can send it directly to you. Um, okay, so just some uh, brief comments on the symptoms. Uh, phytoplasma uh, infections can generally be diagnosed from symptoms but not always. Sometimes it's it's hard, especially if the palm's already dead. Uh, there's no way to know from looking at it. Uh, so a lot of times it requires a uh, series of sequential symptoms that appear to confirm it. But that's almost useless because by the time you confirm it, it's, it's dead anyway. Um, but Basically, in a palm that's infected with lethal bronzing, and I'm using cabbage palm as an example because it's the species that we most often work with down here in Fort Lauderdale that gets infected, um, is you're going to see a premature fruit drop or inflorescence necrosis. Uh, that's always going to be your first indicator that it's a, a phytoplasma infection. Uh, now, if you get something like Ganoderma or Fusarium, you don't always lose the fruit um, or flowers uh, because the uh, the fungus is kind of localized in different areas and isn't necessarily going to affect uh, that structure on the plant. With the phytoplasma infection, it's a systemic uh, infection in the vascular network. It's basically cutting off all transportation of nutrients uh, to these um sink tissue, so your your flowers, your your fruit. So when this vascular system gets inundated, uh, basically the first thing that goes is the uh, the fruit and the flowers because the plant just can't support it. Uh, then after that, you start to see canopy loss. And you always see the oldest fronds die first. So the fronds that are closest to the ground start to turn this bronze coloration. And that... Uh, starts to progress further into younger and younger leaves. Uh, sometimes it's quite quick uh, from symptom onset to complete death. I've seen it in less than a month. Uh, sometimes that uh, canopy loss can take, you know, six, seven months to, to occur. Uh, there's a lot of variability. Uh, why there's var that, that amount of variability, I don't know. Um, it could be the overall health of the plant. It could be the amount of phytoplasma inoculated, where the phytoplasma was inoculated, or a mixture of those, those factors. But you're always going to see that those older fronds go first and then move into younger fronds. And this is another way to distinguish it from a fungal infection, where with fungus, you'll get a more mosaic pattern on the leaf, or sometimes you'll see older fronds that are still green and you can get younger fronds that are brown. Uh, and if that's the case, then you can pretty much rule out uh, phytoplasma because you're always going to get that distinct layering of oldest fronds uh, dying first with younger fronds staying green until, until the, the bitter end, uh, which it happens when the spear leaf uh, collapses due to the apical meristem um, uh, dying because of the uh, blockage of the, the vascular network. And as far as we know, it's always lethal. We've never found a palm that's recovered from the infection and have not found any palm that seems to harbor the phytoplasma but not get, get sick. So uh, at this point, it um, appears to be a 100% uh, lethal disease. Uh, so the vector uh, is Plexus crudus. Uh, this one was determined to be the vector of lethal yellowing in Florida in the 1970s, and uh, just recently we confirmed it as the vector of lethal bronzing as well. Uh, it's this insect here, uh, and basically uh, on the left you have the female, and on the right you have the, uh, the male. Uh, females for this group of insect usually display this kind of uh, 
sexual dimorphism where the females are a little more uh, darker in coloration uh, and the males are, are a little bit paler. Uh, some species it's much more pronounced um, and in, in this species it's, I would say, you know, moderate uh, degree of difference between the males and females. But they're small, about the size of a grain of rice, and they're one of the most widespread and abundant species, not just in Florida on palms, uh, but in the neotropics. Uh, this species goes as far north, uh, based on my data, into southern South Carolina. Uh, it goes, it kind of hugs the coast, and you'll find it along the coastal regions um, of Georgia, uh, the panhandle of Florida, the coastal regions of um, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, and it, then it goes down into to Texas. Um, and it extends pretty much throughout Central America, and you'll find it in Northern South America. Uh, we know it's in Colombia, uh, Venezuela, and going in that direction, uh, the farthest east I know it exists is uh, Trinidad. And it's all throughout the Caribbean islands as well. Uh, there's reports of it from Brazil, um, but I uh, unofficially know that that's not correct. But um, that's a, another story for another day. Uh, but it is a, a widespread species and uh, probably the most economically important one for spread of uh, palm lethal decline phytoplasmas because part of my other research is surveying uh, these different countries for uh, other strains of phytoplasma and other vectors. And we're starting to discover all sorts of closely related species of Haplaxius that look like Haplaxius crudus, uh, but are distinctly different. So while crudus might be the primary player in um, the epidemiology of these phytoplasmas, uh, in certain microclimates or in different regions throughout the, the Caribbean or neotropics, these obscure other species may be uh, more abundant in a specific habitat and potentially causing spread of either LY, LB, or other, uh, other phytoplasms. So that's um, another component um, to my program is going out and surveying for these hoppers and looking for other phytoplasmas to First of all, I'll have an idea of what I'm looking at should they show up here in Florida, because uh, as everybody here knows, uh, invasives are not a matter of if, but when and how many. Um, so uh, I'm trying to be proactive going throughout the region and documenting all these different species that could be a risk to um, exacerbating our palm lethal decline problems. Now, for um, Figuring out that crudus was the vector, we did some lab experiments where uh, we took adults and fed them on spear leaves from infected plants. Um, the only canopy tissue that seems to have the phytoplasma is the any leaves that are connected directly to the apical meristem. Uh, and we let them feed for different time intervals and we would take them off and test them uh, we did two different experiments. We would uh, cut out the salivary glands and test those for the presence of phytoplasma. And then some of the individuals, we moved to a uh, little feeding chamber that had basically sugar water in it. And we were let them, letting them feed on the sucrose uh, and then testing that sucrose with a highly sensitive assay. Uh, it's called digital PCR. Uh, to see if we could find the, the phytoplasma. And we found that they need a minimum of two days of uh, feeding to acquire the pathogen and transmit it. And the optimal time period is five days. So uh, I want you to remember these numbers uh, on the next slide because it plays into um, potential uh, benefit for our, our management program. Uh, but you can see here, um, depending on people's settings and my settings, sometimes these dots are easy to see, sometimes hard. But this yellow square here that says sucrose positive, you'll see little blue dots across. And those represent um, amplification of the phytoplasma DNA. So when we did that, we were able to confirm that it's the, the vector of the, the pathogen. Uh, the next stage is now we're trying to 
um, inoculate different palm species in the greenhouse to say whether or not a specific palm species is uh, susceptible or truly resistant. Um, up until now, assessing this from kind of anecdotal data in the field uh, is useful, but not um, uh, it's not something I, I'm comfortable making recommendations to uh, stakeholders that could potentially have costly uh, economic impact. So um, the next stage is to try and get a, to really nail down which palm species exactly are uh, susceptible and which ones truly are resistant uh, to the pathogen. Okay, so naturally, um, you know, the primary focus when I was, was hired here at UF was to uh, identify the vector and, you know, work on the ecology of it. But, um, you know, an important factor that needs to be dealt with, which I think historically has not been, been done, is uh, developing, doing applied research to give some actual uh, useful recommendations to uh, stakeholders to help try to alleviate these these problems. And uh, one of the first um, things we started doing once we found out what the vector was, was start assessing some different uh, insecticides to see how uh, effective they were against uh, controlling vector populations. Um, now, I know different people, different organizations have different um, desires uh, or needs or abilities for applying insecticides. Uh, but generally, when you have a species this abundant and the problem is already well established in Florida, um, insecticides are going to be one of the best means to try and bring things back into a um, bring the disease and vector population to a level that can then be managed with cultural practices or um, um, if you uh, more organic or green green technologies. But at this point, it's such a well established problem that uh, I think insecticides are going to have to be a one tool in the management of of lethal bronzing. So. We started with imidacloprid, and the reason why um, we I wanted to focus on this because uh, it does have broad efficacy against hemipteran insects, and it's widely used in a lot of different crop systems, and it's very effective at killing uh, hemipterans, things like scales, mealybugs, uh, aphids, white flies, so on and so forth, and it's already widely used as a um, compound in turf grass for things like chinch bugs. And as it turns out, the nymphs of Hyplaxias crudus uh, feed on grasses. The adults are uh, palm feeders and they live in the canopy, but the nymphs are in, in the grass. So we picked uh, turf grass formulated compounds and treated palm seedlings because we just wanted to demonstrate the efficacy of this compound that was already being, that's already being commonly used in a lot of different habitats to kind of provide stakeholders with confidence that this is a viable option for, for managing vectors, either in urban settings or in uh, nurseries or in, in, in private homes. Uh, so, we set up some trials with Phoenix Sylvester seedlings and we treated them with different formulations. Um, we used a granular, a foliar, and a soil drench uh, treatments to uh, um, treat these palms. And then we exposed them to um, cohorts of about 20 to 60 Hyplaxias crudus um, to feed on them. And we took data uh, starting at six hours post feeding and uh, basically drew, drew the experiment out until uh, all the Hyplaxias crudus were dead uh, in these chambers. And we found that even at six hours, there was a significant difference between the control um, survival and the mortality uh, in the soil drench. So the green line here is the soil drench. So even at six hours, uh, 
we had 55% mortality. Um, a little bit different with the spray, but still a noticeable difference. Uh, with the granular treatment, we did not get good knockback of the, the population. And then basically at day one, 24 hours, you're up at around 90% mortality, which is really good. Um, and at day four, we had 100% mortality in the soil drench. Um, so another variable that's important to, to know when looking at, this, at these data is that we were using wild caught Haplaxius crudus because rearing these things is extremely different. And we don't, uh, different, uh, difficult. And we don't have the infrastructure or resources to do it at a level that I would need to do, have like hundreds of replicates for these experiments uh, at the drop of a hat. So basically uh, we dealt with wild caught individuals. So you're going to have some mortality from the stress of moving them from the field into your lab, uh, but that can be ruled out with the control. Um, and you can see there was uh, some mortality, very little, uh, about 20%. Um, and then, but compared to 55%, that's evident that at six hours, you're getting a, a treatment effect. Um, but the fact that we got such high mortality, even at six hours, indicates that the activity of the compound happens very, very, very quickly. So um, because some of these individuals are stressed, they're probably not going to feed right away. So the fact that we didn't get full 100% mortality until four days, um, it could be that all these individuals that were still alive within this four day period we're just not feeding when we expose them to the plant uh, because we see such a strong effect almost immediately. Uh, I'm willing to bet that if all insects feed actively, as soon as they're put on the plant, um, let's say theoretically all 20 of them start feeding immediately, uh, you're going to have hundred percent mortality within 24 four hours. And I have heard of people uh, treating palms with imidacloprid and they, you know, they say almost immediately they're seeing uh, white flies drop off the plants uh, and seeing a noticeable effect. So it's highly effective and it works very quickly on uh, adults of Haplaxius crudus. Now, the reason this, these numbers are important relative to the numbers I showed on the previous slide on the time it takes Plaxius crudus to acquire and transmit the phytoplasma is that this these data indicate that the compound is acting so quickly that it can confer a degree of protection on the plant because it's killing the insect faster than it can acquire or transmit the phytoplasma to the plant. Uh, and this is ideal uh, because it gives us a way to simultaneously reduce vector populations uh, but also indirectly protect the plant from infection. Um, now, this was just done in the greenhouse and in the lab, so we do need to uh, start replicating this in a field setting, which I just got some funding um, from a generous nursery to kind of keep the, the research going. And basically, we're going to uh, start conducting some field trials with imidacloprid in areas with disease spread and monitor um, the, the rate of disease over time to see if we can, can, um, put this greenhouse data and these experiments into a real world setting. And then once we get that, then we can, um, can really, uh, have another solid option to, to deploy in, in the field. But, uh, uh, these data here are, are very promising and in my eyes, uh, it's worth investigating and, and using this as a, as a means to protect uh, plants and reduce vector populations. Um, okay, so that's discussing um, management of the adults uh, by treating palms with uh, imidacloprid insecticide. But like I, I mentioned, what we used was actually turf grass formulated compounds. So if people are already using this in their um, nurseries or in 
like a HOA, a neighborhood, a business park, and imidacloprid is being um, applied to the turf grass for other reasons, uh, it's also likely having an effect on the, the crudest population. But I recognize that uh, insecticides aren't always an option, uh, depending on location, who's in the area, uh, so on and so forth. So uh, we also want to start investigating some uh, more cultural practices that might be beneficial. Uh, and we did a study uh, a few years ago where we documented the distribution and phenology of Hyplaxias crudus nymphs in a palm nursery. Uh, you can see here that they have these uh, raised beds where the palms are, and in between the beds you have these ditches. And over 90, around 95% of the nymph population uh, exist in these ditches. Uh, and I think this is because this is where the water and moisture accumulates and the grass gets really tall. So it's this nice little micro uh, habitat that the nymphs really seem to prefer uh, and where the adults prefer to lay, lay the eggs. So uh, they do very well in these ditches. And I've seen nurseries where they basically remove the grass from the ditches once a year and it completely eradicates the, the vector population. Uh, you'll get a few straggling individuals because they will lay it in the beds, but it's, it's uh, very few. And if you're uh, fundamentally knocking out 95% of your population, you're going to bring it below the threshold needed for that, uh, for lethal bronzing to really take hold and, and become a problem uh, in the nurseries. Now, all this was done in a nursery plot, and we have no idea the nymph distribution in urban settings. Um, it's something that I'm interested in, in pursuing to look at where these nymphs are uh, uh, distributed so that we can provide better recommendations uh, in urban settings. So we can say, okay, you know, you only need to apply insecticide uh, here, here, and here, or in this general area, or in this area, you know, you know, keep the grass really short. Um, whatever options are desirable in that area, it'd be nice to be able to identify which habitat they're 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 going for. I have some ideas as to what where to look for them. Um, they for shorter palms, they seem to like to lay the eggs near the drip line. I have found nymphs right at the drip line of the palm canopy when the fronds are kind of like touching the ground. Uh, and also in my own yard, on multiple occasions, I've seen nymphs of Hyplaxias crudus uh, crawling around uh, sprinkler heads. So right there where some of the water accumulates when it comes out uh, and creates this like damp little area, uh, they seem to like that. So anywhere where there's high levels of moisture is going to be a, um, a, a highly suspect area, but uh, we need to go out and do the, the sampling to actually confirm this and, and quantify it. So we have targets um, in the urban setting, not just in, in nursery settings. Okay, so now I'm going to go a little bit into the technical side with some new developments on uh, diagnostics. Because um, as many of you know, uh, my lab offers a service uh, for testing palms to confirm the uh, infection status of a plant. Uh, and I'm continually trying to develop new tests uh, that give us um, our results faster, a higher degree of accuracy, a higher degree of sensitivity, um, so that if you have a palm that looks healthy, but it's in an area with disease spread, uh, we have a higher degree of confidence to test that and say whether or not it's truly healthy uh, or if it's infected, but just uh, pre-symptom uh, onset. So. Our recent uh, development on our diagnostic uh, is that we designed a test that uh, detects and differentiates all three phytoplasmas. So um, our lethal yellowing is uh, this orange curve, lethal bronzing is the blue curve, and the subgroup E that I mentioned uh, is this green curve. And we included this because it's it's a different phytoplasma, and so far we only know that it infects coconut, but the regions of the Caribbean where it is pretty much is only coconut. 
Um, if it got into Florida, it could jump into other palm species and be another uh, wave of, of serious infections. So we developed this test so that when people send in samples, we don't miss it. Um, so that we can be able to say, okay, the sample is positive for lethal yellowing, lethal bronzing, or if this other phytoplasma shows up, uh, we're not going to miss it. Because the previous test that we had could detect it could detect the subgroup E, but it would not distinguish it. So it might look like lethal yellowing in our samples. Uh, and I wanted to to rectify this. So now uh, when you send in a sample to test, uh, if you're familiar with the process for a single sample, it's a $75 test and you're not actually getting one test, you're getting three. We run three different assays on a sample uh, as quality control. So you get your first one um, that is a highly specific assay that is not going to give false positives. Um, some assays allow for the amplification of ambient bacteria, and that can be very uh, dangerous because if you get a false positive and say it's phytoplasma, it's costly to rip out the palm and replace it. So we want to be as sure as possible what we're dealing with is, is phytoplasma. So the first assay we do is very specific. So if, it, if we get a positive there, we're certain it's phytoplasma. But as a backup, we run these two separate assays that distinguish the phytoplasmas not from just from each other, but also to other bacteria. So let's say some of weird bacteria is out there that also might amplify. These other two assays will be able will allow us to say, are that positive is not phytoplasma because the results match don't match our positive controls for either lethal yellowing, lethal bronzing, or um, the subgroup E phytoplasm. So that's a recent uh, development in the lab on terms of diagnostics. Um, another one is our digital PCR assay. And basically, uh, hi historically, I've offered this service and it was uh, uh, quite expensive. It was $200 a reaction. Uh, the intent of this assay was not for individual palm samples. Uh, it's not practical or cost effective to, to do it. Um, the benefit of this test is that it's 100 times more sensitive than the one I was mentioning in the previous slide. And the goal of this digital PCR assay is more, it's more for um, landscape companies and nurseries that are interested in uh, verifying that their material is clean and bulk sampling. So let's say a nursery has to ship out 20 plants. Uh, and let's say the buyer says, oh, I want to be sure that these are clean. With this assay, what we can do is combine all 20 samples into one and test and basically verify that the in, um, that group of palms is free of phytoplasma. So effectively, instead of $20, $75 a, a palm, uh, you can test 20 palms for uh, $200, which is very cost effective. Uh, now, the problem is what if uh, this assay does not say which palm or how many palms were infected, but it's really, it was designed more as a way to validate that your planting material is free of infection. Um, what happened was with this, they discontinued the model of equipment that we had uh, and we were able to get a, a infrastructure grant from the dean and upgrade to the new system. And we've just um, developed a new uh, assay. And with the new digital PCR system, it's a much more automated and um, it's the workflow is much simpler on this. So we're able to reduce the cost basically and cut it in half. So now you can test a single sample for $100 and have 100 times more sensitivity than our standard $75, um, our standard $75 test. And um, this kind of makes it a little more uh, cost efficient to test individual plants, which is really good if, like I said, you have a plant that looks healthy, but is in an area with other infections and you want to verify to see if this plant is in fact infected. Um, if it's 
infected with a very low titer, this digital PCR assay is going to be much better at picking that up sooner, meaning you can remove those plants that are infected even faster, uh, reducing the likelihood of, of spread in the area. So um, uh, that is a new, it's not a new service. We've had the digital PCR before, uh, but we've upgraded to a new system and now have um, the workflow down to where we can offer that um, digital PCR assay at uh, half the price of what we were doing before. Um, so kind of uh, the savings and times and resources that we get setting up the assay, you know, we, we wanted to translate that into um, a reduced fee in the, the diagnostic service. Um, sampling uh, for palm phytoplasmas hasn't changed. Three grams of uh, um, of plant tissue, uh, living trunk tissue, uh, drill past the pseudobark. Uh, we we use a standard 5 16 inch uh, drill bit. Uh, some larger palm species with thicker pseudobark like Phoenix canariensis, sometimes you may need a longer drill bit to get past the pseudobark, but um, usually 5 16 inches is adequate. Um, shipping, uh, if you take the sample and ship it, the same day, you don't have to put it on ice or anything like that, um, but you do want to get it shipped overnight so we get it the next day. Um, so if you're going to, like if for whatever reason you have to sample on a Thursday or Friday and aren't are worried about getting it out, you can put it in the refrigerator over the weekend and then ship overnight on, on Monday. Uh, you don't have to... Um, you don't have to ship it with a with an ice pack or anything like that. Um, so I do recommend shipping by FedEx or UPS uh, and not the postal service simply because of the how we're set up here at uh, at um, Fort Lauderdale. Whenever a FedEx or UPS envelope shows up, it goes onto the table in the admin office and I get an email that we received the package. If you do it through UPS, uh, it just gets sorted into my mailbox and they don't notify me for that. And meaning I only, whenever I um, get the motivation to walk across the parking lot, I check my mailbox. And if it's been sitting there for a couple of days, that's not good. So um, if you are going to send it by USPS, that's fine. Just uh, send me an email in advance letting me know so I know to to keep an eye out for it. But generally, it's just it's easier to do FedEx or, or UPS. Um, I'm a little lazy about walking across the parking lot. So um, the instructions and submission forms are available at my website. I have the link here. Uh, there's a services tab and there you can find forms, uh, EDIS, everything you need to take the sample. Uh, but as you know, if something's not clear or you're not comfortable, you're more than welcome to to email me or call me and, and get get further details on on the process. Um, so I now one last thing to finish up. Uh, it's a recent advancement that uh, is, I'm very excited about and I hope to pursue in the near future is that we've um, identified uh, volatiles being emitted from infected plants. And basically uh, we sampled areas where we had active disease spread of lethal bronzing and we tested infected plants healthy plants that were next to the infected plants, and then healthy plants that were far away from the disease area. And we basically identified that the infected plants are emitting a specific signal and the non-infected plants adjacent to them are responding with a compound that is actually a, an antimicrobial compound that is commonly used in post-crop uh, harvest, post harvest crop protection. So when they harvest your fruits and all this stuff, uh, they treat it with this to prevent bacterial and fungal growth. And we found that the infected or the healthy pawns that are in, in danger of infection are producing this uh, within what appears to be an attempt to prevent uh, from invasion from, from the infection. So you can see the left set of columns is I, that's the infected palm. They're producing elevated amounts of hexanol and 2-hexanol, and the columns in the middle 
the NIT, which is uh, non-infected threatened, is producing this compound 3-hexanol. And you don't see this trend in, in the healthy palms that are outside the, the disease area. So um, this compound appears to be an attempt by the palm to produce its own natural defenses um, at uh, preventing infection of the phytoplasma. And when I saw this data, I got, this data, I got excited because I've noticed cases where groups of palms will have a few individuals infected and then the ones around it stay healthy. But then you'll get jump spread where palms further away will start getting infected. And I'm curious if to some extent this compound does protect palms from um, being infected with the phytoplasma. Because what we might be able to do is um, basically lie to the plants and set up dispensers of these alarm uh, volatiles that are emitted by infected plants and basically flood the environment with these compounds and trick the plants into thinking there's phytoplasma, giving them, so they start uh, producing their own natural defenses. And then if the disease gets introduced in the area, uh, hopefully it'll be enough defense to prevent it from uh, infecting them. And I really like this route because we wouldn't have to drill holes into the palm like we need to if we're injecting OTC, the antibiotic, or with imidacloprid, uh, sometimes people want to inject the insecticide. Uh, with this way, it's a, it's a natural compound the plant is producing and you don't have to go around injecting. So it's kind of a, what I see as a potential for a very cost-effective large-scale management option in all sorts of different habitats, nurseries, urban settings, uh, you name it. So that's something I'm interested in, in, in pursuing. Uh, but also another possibility, uh, we started injecting the alarm signal directly into the plant. So we got a pressurized injector and flooded the plant with the, um, the alarm signal. And we were able to get that plant to start producing the um, signal that the threatened plants uh, produce. So we know which compound is responsible for eliciting the um, uh, defense response in the plants. So we injected the trans 2 hexanol, and then that plant began producing 3 hexanol. The cool thing is, at three weeks post injection, we got a drop in phytoplasma titer. So we measured the amount of phytoplasma in the infected palm. And this was a very big deal because um, OTC, if done correctly, can be helpful in preventing the plant, but it doesn't move systemically throughout the trunk. So you cannot cure a palm with OTC injections. You can only give the plant some degree of protection. With this compound, because it's in liquid form and it's a small, like six carbon chain, it's very easy to get it to move systemically throughout the plant. So here we have real potential to develop a curative treatment uh, by injecting 3-hexanol directly into the plant uh, at a super high dose. So one area of research we wanna pursue is seeing if we can come up with a concentration and formulation of this compound to reverse an infection if we catch it soon enough. Some plants are just too far gone and you won't be able to cure it no matter what. But if you potentially get a plant at the very early onset of symptoms, uh, we might be able to develop a cure, uh, which would be practical, not for large area of treating, but if you have a high value plant in an area that's very difficult to remove and replace, um, like a nice hotel or a courtyard or something like this, uh, this may be an option to have on hand in the event of an emergency. Um, so with that, uh, I'm done. And that's my website. Uh, and that's my email address. And I guess we can open it up for questions. Now. Brian, thank you so much. You covered a lot and we've got uh, quite a few questions that have come through. Um, I'll ask uh, ask them as they came in. Um, is there a natural enemy for the vector? Um, yes. Uh, short answer is yes. Um, the adults, <clears throat> excuse me. So the adults are they fall prey to primarily jumping spiders. Uh, I don't see that as a 
a path of biocontrol. Um, there might be a fungus. Uh, I have found adults of Plaxius crudus dead in the field that have fungal bodies growing out of them. I don't know if that's a um, pathogenic fungus on the adults of crudus or it's a secondary growth after the adult dies naturally and it just kicks in. That's something that I'm kind of interested in, in pursuing. Uh, the nymphs actually, um, there's a little bit more potential there. We know that there's a nematode in the soil that is pathogenic on Haplaxius crudus nymphs. And it's actually a species of nematode that's here in North America. And it, to my knowledge is commercially available um, so that might be an option for controlling nymphs and nurseries as well, uh, but we haven't really pursued that um, uh, looking at the, the ability to use nematodes or how much you would need to gain uh, effective control. Um, so far, we've just dealt, done with, um, dealt with insecticide trials, but uh, there are some natural enemies out there uh, that, that do control um, at least the nymphs. As far as parasitoids, um, none that we're aware of, but uh, there may be elsewhere in the tropics. Uh, so that, you know, potentially may be something to to explore. But Okay. It was pretty exciting about the potential curative, uh, you know, applications down the road. Um, I, you know, I was really excited to to know that there's there's things in the works. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this gentleman was under the impression that uh, imidacloprid, when it's inside the plant, moves very slowly. Is that the case? Um, I don't directly know um, the physics of the, the compound moving into the, the plant. My experience with it, um, so when we did our trials, we treated the plants uh, two weeks prior to exposing them to insects at the recommendation of um, the my collaborators who work with the compound uh, more often, or, or they, they deal with it on a, a regular basis. So uh, in a palm seedling, the soil drench, it got systemic in the plant uh, within two weeks. Um, now I have had... Uh, colleagues in the the green industries tell me that when they are treating coconut palm um they inject the imidacloprid and when they do that and they're controlling white flies they see the white flies start falling off uh very quickly within an hour oh, wow. um so the rate it moves throughout the plant probably depends heavily on the formulation i'm guessing um so that's like like i said the compounds we used were turf products and you know obviously it's gonna uh translocate faster and turf formulated is going to be faster in, in turf grass um and the formulations for metacloprid in palms at least in the manner of injecting appear to be moving in it pretty quickly, but I haven't exhaustively, you know, analyzed it and done chemical analysis. That's, I haven't, I haven't really, really focused on that, okay. but it's, it seems to be quick from my observations, but um, it may not always be um, from, from case to case. And it probably also depends on time of year and time of day and, and so on. And I would so think forth. temperature would, might affect it as well. Yeah. Sure. Um, and do you know any of the the trade names of the products that uh, you've been using the imidacloprid imidacloprid products that you've been using? Yeah, let me pull that up real quick. Um, I know it's Merit. That's the one we used. Uh, by no means an endorsement. Uh, it's just what we used. Right. Um, let's see here. I just submitted the manuscript on that data, so I have it fresh on my. Uh, 
Yeah. So if can everybody see this chart? Um, yes. Yeah. They, these are the, the products um, that we used in the trial. Fantastic. Um, you know, you mentioned a little bit about OTC. Is is that still an option, you know, for uh, management? Yeah, it's it's always an option. Um, and um, so, yeah, OTC is always an option. Like I said, it's if done properly, uh, it's effective at pre preventing infection. Um, obviously, I know nobody likes to. Um, um, nobody likes to drill holes into the palms. Um, it's obviously not great for the plant. Uh, it's time consuming, laborious if you're treating a lot of plants. Um, and over time, uh, again, we haven't quantified this and studied it to have a, an exact time frame. But I know that at some point you're going to get diminishing returns on any, whether it's insecticide or OTC. Uh, because as you in, keep injecting, you're, you might be drilling new holes, but it, it's connected to vascular tissue that's been disrupted. So over time, your uptake is probably going to diminish. Um, so I, like in my mind, uh, if you've got the time and money and it's a high value one, you can continue doing it. Um, I would argue that probably doing it at a focusing in a more specific time of year when the vector population is higher is more practical um, just to reduce the number of injections you need to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, in certain circumstances, um, if you want to be extra cautious, by all means, OTC is still, still an option. So. Okay. And how often would we need to um, treat with imidacloprid um, to control the vectors? It's a good question. I don't know that. Um, we haven't really done field trials with it yet. Um, so, um, like I said, I just got some some funding from a nursery, and the project I'm going to have my postdoc do is we're going to coordinate and basically start treating areas. Um, uh, here at the center, we have a lot of LV spreading. So we're going to go out and treat plants and um, basically see how long we um, will treat, you know, once a year, measure the response and see how long it takes um, to for the population to, to bounce back. Um, you know, those are the kind of stuff that would be ideal to do in a nursery, but uh, no nursery in the right mind is going to let me do that kind of research um, when they're trying to turn a profit. So. Um, most of the the um, irresponsible mad science we have to do here at the research center. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, does the plant disease clinic in Gainesville offer that new assay testing um, like you do? Uh, I don't believe so. Uh, I don't know exactly what assay they're running, but I don't believe they're running the qPCR. That's it's the standard one. Um, I don't know exactly their their protocol and test that they use, um, but I, to my knowledge, they're not using qPCR. Okay. Um, can a new palm be planted where one uh, succumbed to lethal bronzing? Oh, good question. Uh, technically, yes. Um, it's not like uh, Ganoderma or one of these fungal infections where. There's spores in the soil and you, and you reinfect. If a palm dies from lethal bronzing, you can put the same species in that spot and there's no mechanical spread. Nothing from the soil is going to reinfect. It's always vector transmitted. Now, whether or not you should do that depends heavily on the local disease pr pressure from, from the vector um, and reinfecting that plant after the fact. Now, um, I forgot to mention this in the talk, but this is a perfect moment to mention it. Um, it's a, a another uh, free service my lab does where if you have a palm that dies and you want to put it the same one back, um, I know sometimes HOAs can be stubborn about this, so it's a good way to 
to, to work around it. Uh, but basically, if you need to put the same plant back and are concerned, uh, I'll work with whoever it is and set up sticky traps and look at the vector population in the area. So uh, if you put out sticky traps, change them once a week, send them to me, I'll assess the vector population. I'll count them and give you the numbers. Uh, it, there's no charge on that. Uh, if there's no crudus in the area, it would indicate that that plant was probably infected a long time ago or came in infected. Uh, and if basically we do a few samplings and we can't find crudus on the sticky traps, um, or if it's a low abundance, I can say, okay, with reasonable, uh, it, it's very unlikely that the plant's going to get infected if you re replant. Now, if you send me a sticky trap and it's covered with the vector and uh, the one service that then we can follow up is we test the insects for um, for phytoplasma. I don't remember how much I the, the fee is because we haven't really done it that much, but um, the we can test the crudus for phytoplasma. So if you get a diseased plant and you send me a trap covered with crudus and they're coming up positive, that's when you may want to rethink replanting the same species or if you have to take really good cautions with treating so i would say load that plant up with both uh imidacloprid and otc before you bring it into the area to give it uh some protection but then also start treating in the area um that's a case where i would say use imidacloprid in the grass around where your area is to knock the vector population down to um, protect it. Or if you're flexible, just go with a palm species that's not uh, particularly susceptible or place it with a different kind of plant if that's what you, you want. Great. Um, this kind of piggybacks on what you were just talking about. Uh, this gentleman uh, lost a sable palm and he's concerned about the other 80 sable palms on the property. Um, how would you recommend proceeding? Uh, in that case, um, probably to start, you probably want to get an idea what the vector population is. Right. So with that and a number of palms, uh, I would say start sticking uh, some sticky traps out. Uh, you can reach out to me by email and we can coordinate uh, sticky traps. You can buy any sort of them on uh, Amazon or any any website. Uh, now, the key with sticky traps is they have to be placed within the palm canopy to be effective at collecting the insects. So, um, you know, you need to have palms that uh, they may not be the ones dying from the disease, but shorter palms that you have access to the canopy that you want to put them so they're enclosed within the canopy. And, uh, you know, for 80 palms, um, depending on the area, I would say if you put out five or six sticky traps, um, change them weekly and then send them to me and we can look at the vector population to see uh, to see what's going on. Because uh, if you have a sizable population, that's when probably you want to treat. Um, now, if there's no grass and as I don't know what the, the habitat's like, if there's uh, if it's bare underneath, then something else is going on uh, that something was brought in or uh, or whatnot, and you'd have to treat the palms. But if there's a lot of grass in the area, you can treat the grass. But you just reach out to me with details, and we can, we can work on that. Fantastic. Um, is there an IGR or gut fungus that may work against the insect vector? Um, probably. Um, but again, it's something we haven't really pursued. Okay. Um, yeah, I would I'm guessing yes, but I, I don't know. And it's, it's one of those things, one of the many projects that would, I'd like to do eventually. <laughs> and, you know, I'll, I'll kind of end with a real tough one. Um, a homeowner has a palm. How should a homeowner maintain a healthy palm? Um, <laughs> I, I told you it would be a tough one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, in context of lethal bronzing or just in general? Just kind of in the context of lethal bronzing. Okay. Um, hmm. 
that's tough because I my general vibe is that um they, they usually got to learn the hard way <laughs> uh uh is from what I've seen from experience but yeah. um I always say if it were me um in my yard I'm uh like I try to have as little grass as possible uh it keeps the vector population down um simply because I got you know kids I don't like dumping lots of chemicals out into the yard um on, on a regular basis um I have a wonderful population of the Florida snow <laughs> that uh probably dominates my yard <laughs> so um you know having a more um i guess the term is the florida friendly landscape with more native plants less grass that's a you know on a private residence that's a great way to keep um crudish populations down is minimizing grass because that's the key that's where the um immatures um feed so if you can mix you know different ornamentals or bushes and reduce the the amount of grass in your area at least um at least where uh you know you get moisture accumulation like my yard slopes there's a dip in the back so i suspect i know where they're hiding um like i said i find them around my sprinkler heads um so maybe like if you you could put a little bit of a, a midocloprid just around the sprinkler head um areas where you know they're going to target for for living um might be be a wise choice um but in general my approach to you know i have a lot of palms at my house uh and a lot of like neat ones that i bought from from nurseries that i have no idea if they're susceptible to to lethal bronzing and i don't want them to die so my like the big back portion of my yard is basically like rock paths and mulch beds and um i keep the grass you know from the dirt areas i i so it's time consuming and costly so eventually i'm transferring my backyard into a little like kind of oasis where i virtually have no grass at all now that's not for everybody so if you've got grass and want a nice yard um you know treating target areas with with insecticide can help but okay. more or less that's how I would would recommend going about it. Awesome. And I, there I, were, I, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, Brian. Go ahead. Uh, I like to tease uh, Micah, the the horticulturist on palms, who who focuses on um, uh, uh, fertilizers, saying, "Oh, you should fertilize your palm." And I I I kid her that um, the palms with a full nutrient load are the ones that are more susceptible to lethal bronzing because there's all those nutrients for the phytoplasma. And, so don't fertilize your pulse. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, thank you so very much uh, from reading the comments in in the uh, the chat. You know, uh, numerous people were were so happy with this information. It's up to date. It's current, um, um, and and they really uh, found it uh, you know really helpful. So thank you so much for taking the time. Um, I would like to to mention to everybody just to remind you that again our next webinar is going to be February thirteenth. That uh, 10 a.m. And uh, that's going to be Emily Lang from FDEP and Deirdre Irwin from the Southwest Water Management District talking about the newly released irrigation design standards. Um, everybody, thank you so much. Reminder, just make sure you fill out your uh, evaluation. As Claire said earlier, that really helps us out. Dr. Bader, thank you so very much. I uh, really appreciate you taking me. the time. Cool. Everybody, thank you very much.